All right, so welcome everyone to today's Rural Research Collaborative Learning Network. Today, I'm thrilled to have Dr. David Schmidt with us, from who is a Senior Program Manager for the Rural Research for the Health Education <laughs> Training Institute. And today, David will be pre presenting on preparing an abstract for a conference. But before we hear the wise words of David, um, we're just going to go through a bit of uh, formalities. So I'd just like to, before we commence, uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters where we work and live. We acknowledge the traditional custodians' living culture, their connection to country, and their contribution to the life of this region. We pay our respects to ancestors and elders of the region and to all Aboriginal people, past, present and future, and any Aboriginal people joining us here today. So welcome. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Rural Research Collaborative Learning Network, so fondly known as the RR Clan, we're a consolidated partnership comprising of 10 New South Wales local health districts, the New South Wales Health Education and Training Institute, HETI, the Tropical Academic Health Centre, which is an NHMRC accredited research translation centre in Queensland and offers support to seven Queensland hospital and health services, the Darling Downs Health and Innovation Research Collaborative and the Darling Downs Southwestern and Wide Bay Hospital and Health Service. The RR Clan is a rurally led initiative that aims to provide high quality research education and training to healthcare staff working in rural, regional and remote areas. And so our aim is to provide you with the education and training opportunities to build key skills in how to use and undertake research and improve healthcare delivery. So that is who we are. If you haven't come across us before, if you're new to RR Clan and missed any of the action in 2022 or our first uh, seminar in 2024, we do record all of our seminars and we post them to our RR Clan YouTube channel. Um, so please be sure to visit that channel and take a look at what seminars have been delivered in the past. I'll pop that link in the chat very shortly. Keeping along that thought process, we are recording today's session, so as much as possible, please keep your microphones on mute. And in terms of interacting with David and the session, we are encouraging people to ask lots of questions. Um, and in the first instance, please just direct your questions to the chat. And David has a number of stop points throughout his presentation to, to answer some of these questions. And if we've got time at the end, we'll endeavour to, to invite you to the floor and come off mute and ask your question, David. So it's with great pleasure I'd like to introduce you to Dr David Schmidt, who is a Senior Manager for the Rural Research with the Health Education and Training Institute, which is part of the New South Wales Health. David is a passionate advocate for rural clinician-led research and has com recently completed a PhD on the development of individual and organisational research capability within rural health workplaces. And interestingly, he has a frog in his letterbox named Grumpy. If you haven't already come across David in your research journey, consider this your very warm welcome and introduction to him and an opportunity to tap into his extensive knowledge of all things research. I'd now like to hand it over to David. So welcome, David. Oh, thank you, Zoe. Um, I'll get my screen share happening. Uh, as Zoe said, we do have some points throughout the session where there's a chance to um, to pop questions into the chat and for me to respond to those. Um, excuse me. And also for the collaborative wisdom of the group to respond to those as well. So we're here to help each other. Uh, so we're going to talk today about preparing an abstract for a conference. It's meant to be a really an interactive and um, yeah, practical session. So hopefully there'll be a minimum of big research jargon and, a, and an abundance of um, helpful tips. But it would be really good if you have in your own mind um, a, a conference that you might be looking to present at because that'll help to steer your thoughts. Um, I know Zoe's already done uh, acknowledgement of country. I'd like to 
add my own acknowledgement to that, that I come to you today from the traditional lands of the Turinganj people of the Yuan Nation. And I'd also like to acknowledge that most of, well, the, the vast bulk of my research work has been based in Western research traditions. Um, but I also acknowledge that there is the uh, Aboriginal ways of knowing, being and doing that uh, can be a really valuable way to understand uh, the world and research. And um, so just acknowledging that I'm not speaking from, from that perspective, um, my traditions are very much in the Western side of things. The other thing I, I do want to acknowledge is that even though I've managed to present in, gosh, uh, have an abstract pre, um, accepted for or presented in every state or territory in New South well, in in Australia. Sorry, um, I haven't been uh, successful in presenting overseas just yet. So I'm speaking very much from an Australian perspective. If anyone else need wants to leap in and provide an international perspective at some point, you're more than welcome to do so. OK, so what we hope to cover in this session. Firstly, a, a really quick overview about what conference abstracts are, what they're for and how are they assessed. Uh, we will talk briefly on finding the right conference for your work and I've got some um, straightforward guidance for that. How to structure an abstract. How to pick a title for your abstract that will catch the attention of the people who are assessing your abstract how to align your work to the conference themes. And lastly, some practical tips for writing research in progress abstracts, because uh, there's a, a little, little trick or two for those. Now we are going to have some activities along the way, and the activities are there for reflection time for you to just jot down some ideas of what you'd like to tell people, or in, in this first activity, what you would like to tell people, or what you'd like to present on, and who are the people that you need to tell. So just making a quick note about your audience and the key message that you're going to share with that audience. Now, during the activity slides, I will just stop talking for a minute or two, but that's when I'm going to duck across and check the chat to see if there's any questions. So if I go silent for a minute, it's because I'm just seeing if there's any questions over in the chat box. Which there isn't so far. What's the frog's name? The frog's name is Grumpy. Well, that's what we call him. Um, we're not entirely sure that he's a he, um, but you'll see more of Grumpy as we go. Okay. So first thing that we start off with is being really, really clear about what your key message and who your audience is. Conference abstracts, just by a, a, a little bit of an overview, they're your opportunity to pitch your idea to conference organisers to say, I should have a place on your program. Each conference is a little bit different. Um, some conferences will allow you up to around 400 words for you to pitch your ideas. Others are much shorter than that. Sometimes you only get 150 words. Um, the place you find of all of, all of this information is at the conference websites. So you've got a very short space, a very small amount of words for you to get your idea across. Now, the way conference organisers decide who gets to present is by a scientific committee. So your scientific committee will look at your abstracts as they, all of the abstracts that come in, um, and decide which of those get a place on the scientific program of, of the of the conference. Now, your scientific committee is usually a bit of a mixed bag. It is going to be clinicians, uh, if it's a clinical conference, and academics and researchers. You're going to get people from different backgrounds. Um, 
usually within your profession if it's a professional conference but for a general conference like a rural health conference you might have an audience uh sorry a, a committee that's made up of um people who might be nurses or allied health or researchers or psychologists you never quite know and usually they're selected by the conference organizing committee occasionally you will um see invitations go out for people to be part of a scientific committee to judge abstracts for a conference. If you ever, ever, ever get the chance, go for it. It's great fun. Um, some conferences you can uh, review 10, um, 10 abstracts, other times it might be up to 60, um, which is a lot, um, but it does depend on the size of the conference. So, uh, a scientific committee will sit down and they'll look at three key things. The first thing they will look for is the conference theme and how well the abstract aligns with that theme. Um, I was on a scientific committee for a national conference once and the first advice they had for uh, members of the scientific committee is does this fit with our theme? If not, read no further. So you really want to make sure that the abstract that you're writing fits with the theme of the conference. The next thing that the scientific committee will look for is what's new. Um, I don't know about you when we go to a conference, but if I ever get to go to a conference, the things that I'm looking for is what's new and what can I do with it? So that novelty factor is really important. Um, so we've got fit with theme is the first thing they look for. Secondly, what's new? So what does this abstract or this idea add? And then they look at the quality of the abstract. Did you stick to the word limit? Um, are there typos? Are the ideas well structured? Is it clear what you did or what it is that you're trying to get across? We'll get more into that quality of writing in a, a little bit later in the in the talk. So once they weigh up, is it a good, good fit for the theme? Does it bring something new? And is it well constructed and well written? Then those are the ones that get accepted. And then there's also the issue of how big a conference is it? How many rooms do they have? How many sessions are they trying to run? Do they have particular sub themes that they want represented? And once everything gets filtered through all of that, then finally the program is written and all of those jigsaw pieces are fitted together to bring the conference together. So we start with that idea of, does it fit the conference theme? Works through, is it new, is it good? And does it fit with everything else that we've got going on in the program? And if it does all of that, then it's a yes. Now in terms of how many abstracts come in and how many abstracts get accepted, it just varies from conference to conference. Um, for a, a big national conference where you're going for four days and there's 300 sessions to fill, you know, there might be a lot of abstracts coming in, but they might have a lot of places to offer as well. A smaller conference might have less people applying for it, but it might be tighter in terms of um, the number of, of spaces that are available. So those are the things that the scientific committee consider. One of the things to think about for you though, is finding the right conference. Now I'm gonna take you back, I'm gonna get you to step into a time machine with me and we'll go back to 2010 uh, when I was younger and slimmer and had more hair. And I was presenting at my very first conference and I was super excited because this was the very first conference abstract that I'd ever written and I got accepted. 
and I was so excited. It was the Sarah conference in 2010. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Sarah, it stands for Services for Australia Rural and Remote Allied Health. And it was an allied health conference, really health focused. And my topic was on making plaster casts, as was befitting my physiotherapy background. Now that all sounds good, but when you think about allied health, um, there's what, 20 something professions that make up allied health? And physiotherapy is one of those professions. And then when you think about well, how many states and territories are there in Australia and how many of those do act, do physios actually do plastering in? It's actually less than half. In, in many states of Australia, plasters are made by plaster technicians, not physios. And so out of a, so we, let me do the sums. Out of the 150 people at the conference, if physios made up maybe a fifth of those, we're, we're, we're down to 30 people. And if a fifth of those or half of those came from states where, um, you know, physios did plastering, we're down to, what's half of 15? I should have picked better numbers, shouldn't I? Uh, seven or eight. And out of all of those few physios who came from those states where plastering was something that they did, how many of those were actually, that was part of their, their, their stuff? How many of those? So of this conference of 150 people, there was about two or three that were interested in my topic. Now that's okay, because the other part of finding the right conference was, it was in Broome at Cable Beach. So you know, I got to go to Broome and, and go for a camel ride on Cable Beach. But um, ultimately, when you're thinking about picking a conference, you want to pick a conference that helps you reach the right audience. And as much as I love the camel ride on Cable Beach, it wasn't a great audience for that particular kind of work. And so one of the things about picking the right conference is to have a think about the breadth of your topic. Now, in that example, um, it was a specific topic. And so perhaps a better fit would have been a specific conference, a physiotherapy conference or a fracture management kind of orthopedic type conference might have been a better fit. Um, so if you've got a specific topic that you want to present on something discipline specific or something really condition specific, like a, a palliative care type thing, for example, um, maybe a specific conference is a better fit. If you're looking to go to a general conference, such as the National Rural Health Conference that's coming up later this year, perhaps a more general topic, maybe something multidisciplinary might be a better fit for that kind of conference. I know this sounds really obvious, but specific topic for specific conferences and general topics for general conferences. So the right fit is fitting your topic, um, getting the, the breadth of your topic to fit your audience. The next is this idea of conference themes. So um, last year, I really, really wanted to present at the International Institute for Qualitative Methodology Conference, um, partly because it's in Canada, um, but mainly because I was doing some stuff uh, around critical realism and around using cartooning for um, as a means of qualitative analysis, which I thought would be a great fit. But then they had this conference theme of doing intersectionality in health research. And I looked at that and went, if I have to Google all of the words in the theme to understand it, maybe that's not the right fit for my work. So having learned from previous experience, I didn't put in an abstract for that one because I didn't think it'd be a good fit. The other thing for picking the right fit, so we've got, you know, have you got the right audience? Does your work fit with the theme? And then there's practical considerations. Um, going to Canada would be lovely. Um, I don't know who would pay for it. So, you know, maybe that's not, um, maybe that's not the best fit for me at the moment. 
is some of those those practical considerations. Um, other things you might bear in mind is, you know, do you have a conference where you'd like to present a poster and they only do e-posters, but you've got a paper poster that you wanted to present? You know, some of these these practical kinds of things. So once you weigh all of those up, then you know that's the conference I want to present at. Before we sit down to do that, though, we're going to take a bit of a pause and have another reflection session just for a couple of minutes. Have a think about the topic you might like to present at a conference. Is it broad or specific? And where would you find an audience for that? And then what sort of practical things do you need to think about? Um, might be things like you know, funding, travel, childcare, uh, organisational approvals, other things like that. So I'm going to stop talking for a minute and go and check check the chat. So I can see Jackie had a question about consumers there in the chat. Ooh, that's a good question, Catherine. I'll come back to that. Um, Jackie, can you come off mute for a second? Just ask what what was it that you meant about consumers? Question mark. Oh, I was. Um, I heard that consumers can be part of the committee looking at the abstracts as well at certain conferences. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely they can. Um, and that's a really good thing. Uh, sometimes consumers can also be presenters at a conference. And one of the best conferences I went to was in 2012 in Canberra in winter. Yes, I know that sounds like a really strange thing to say that a conference in Canberra in winter would be a good thing. Um, but there was a consumer rep who presented on uh, how things like mental health and dental care and audiometry aren't um, covered under Medicare and they had a wonderful presentation called put the head back on the body and I absolutely like that's 12 years ago and I still remember um, that talk it obviously left an impression. Uh, Catherine asked in what way do conference abstracts differ from article abstracts? Um, I think the main way that they differ is that you're trying to get your align your stuff with their theme. Normally when you're doing an article abstract, it's a summary of what you've done and you're giving a balanced summary to say, dear person, here is um, here is what you can expect when you read the rest of the article. Whereas a conference abstract is a bit more of a sales pitch. It's more of a, you've given us this particular box for me to, to put it, put my stuff into, so I'm shaping it to fit in that box. Okay, let's get back to where we were. Okay, now I have been talking for 15, 20 minutes and I haven't yet, we haven't got to write in the abstract yet. And I'm sorry, we, we will get there, but um, sometimes this, this making sure that you're going for the right conference and you, you've got your ideas in the right way is the, the best place to start. But also, you know, I, I, I'm a researcher, I teach research, and so my, my first thought is to, well, you know, present on research, but that's not the only stuff you can present. Uh, you might have uh, service reviews like quality improvement projects. You don't have to have done, a, a, you know, a full research project to present at a conference. You might have some exciting policy analysis. I'm open to that idea, it could happen. Um, some conferences really encourage uh, creative arts type work and particularly that intersection of arts and health. So have a think about what's the thing that's going to be a good thing that you want to share with that audience. And I think for, uh, for us clinicians, uh, we do tend to, uh, 
we we do tend to shy away from presenting because we haven't necessarily done research but we might have done an amazing quality improvement project or you know we've made a significant change of service design in your uh in your space and you know you want to share that great share that um because Let's think about why people go to conferences so they can find out what's new. So if you've done something new and tried something new, that can be really valuable. Now, while we do talk about presenting at a conference, there's presentations and there's presentations. So not all conferences involve you standing up and, and giving a talk in front of a group of people. Um, and you know oral presentations are certainly one way of doing it um i showed you before a very blurry picture of my very first poster presentation and i'm glad it was blurry because it wasn't a great poster but hey we all got to start somewhere um poster presentations are actually really good if you want to talk to people in detail now i know i said that that wasn't a great fit uh, that conference wasn't a great fit for my work but doing a poster meant that I could sit down with the two to three people that were interested and have a really good yarn with them and go into detail. I could talk to each of them for half an hour, which I couldn't do if I had a 10 minute talking slot in an oral presentation or 15 minute talking slot. So um, sometimes poster presentations can be a really, really good way to communicate your ideas. And um, sometimes uh, you might be offered a, what's known as a lightning presentation. It's just like a, a really short talk. You might have a poster that you stand next to and talk to, like a one slide that you talk next to for five minutes. Um, different conferences do offer different options. For all of your presentation type things though, the abstracts are generally the same with the exception of workshops. Now, Workshops are a little bit different at conferences. They tend to be a lot more interactive. So your, your presentations are very much, you're delivering information to the audience and then getting to the end and hoping that you get one question because that meant that people were awake, but not too many questions because you don't want to answer anything too tricky. Um, yes, I know, been there. Workshops are much more interactive and you usually have to set out an, ab an abstract that has different information in it. You, you tend to have learning goals for the workshop and at the end of this workshop, people will able be able to A, B, C, D, E, etc. So, uh, but most of the, the abstracts are laid out pretty much the same. In terms of structuring an abstract, a lot of conferences these days have a template on their website. So if they provide you with a template, use it. If you don't use their template, um, then you're less likely to get accepted. If they haven't given you a template, then my advice is usually to have a structure that follows the IMRAD format. So that's introduction, methods, results, and discussion. Um, this will look really familiar because it's the kind of thing that we generally see in articles all over the place. Okay. Now I'm gonna take us to some real life example here. Um, so I've been eyeing off the 17th National Rural Health Conference which is on in September this year in sunny Perth, if anyone's interested in going across the country. And abstracts are open at the moment, so it's very timely. Now, if we look at this first point, so this is their abstract abstract guidelines. Oh, gosh, you'd think I'd be able to say abstract when I'm presenting on abstracts. These are their abstract guidelines for the National Rural Health Conference. If we look at this first point, they've given us slightly, I'm just gonna duck back. So we had the IMRAD format here. They've given us slightly different ones, aims, methods, relevance, results, and conclusions. So similar, but not the same. Um, so if they have given you um, an outline of aims, methods, relevance, results, and conclusions, 
use those subheadings. They've given us some really helpful advice. Abstract titles should be no more than 12 words. Um, abstracts need to be no longer than 400 words. All that sounds good so far. You don't put in author details, not in the abstract itself. You do in the, um, the, the, the submission page online, but um, not in the abstract um, because there usually is a blind review. So the reviewers don't know who wrote the abstract and the person submitting the abstract don't get to find out who the reviewers are. That's meant to make sure that, you know, Professor such and such doesn't get on the on the program just because they're Professor such and such. Uh, really, one thing to think about with abstracts is no references, no pictures, no figures, no tables. It's just words. So occasionally you will get uh, a, a conference where they say that you should include up to two references. If that's what they tell you to do, then stick with that. Um, abstracts must be written in English and you have to have approval from co-authors. Now co-authors on an abstract are the same as co-authors on any academic work. Uh, they should be. Uh, Gosh, I haven't put this in the slides, but I'll try and remember off the top of my head. There's a, usually a four point checklist to uh, make sure people are, um, qualify as authors. They need to be involved in the actual doing of the, the project or the, the study or whatever it was. Um, they need to have contributed to the writing. Um, they need to approve the final work and need to take responsibility um, for it once it's out in the public domain. And I'm hoping that Francis will correct me in the chat if I've missed anything important there. So I saw you there, Francis. You don't get off scot free. You have to work while you're here. So we've got our general structure uh, and with that MRAD format is the, the one that is fairly universal, or in this case, it was aims uh, rather than introduction. But just when you're sitting down to write your abstract, the first thing to think about is keeping the aims and introductions to a minimum. Remember why people go to conferences? To find out what's new. So the introductions is what's old. Keep that short. With your methods section, Methods should be just enough so that people can believe what's coming next, and that's your results. So with your methods, just enough for it to be believable. Um, and this is where it gets tricky. You've only got a couple of hundred words, um, so your methods need to be specific, but short. Um, is there anyone apart from me who goes to a conference and wants to know how the studies were done? I mean, I do, but you know, usually most people are really interested in the results because that's what people come for, to find out what's new. So when you're writing your results in an abstract, those results need to be specific. So you need to put data in your abstract. So put some numbers in if you're doing number -y, quantitative research. Uh, if you measured things, give the measures. Um, if you've doing qualitative research, give people the uh, give people the themes because the themes are your data. Um, and then in your discussion or implications or um, conclusion section, we need to emphasize what's known as the so what factor. So the results are we found this new thing and then the so what factor is now that we know that, so what? What can we do with it? What does it mean? And all of this, you want it to be a minimum of waffle, really direct, really straightforward writing. And um, someone told me once that an abstract stands for absolutely straightforward actual data. And that stuck with me, stuck with me. So that's for research abstracts. So we've got short introduction, 
short methods, bulk of the, the words go into what's new in results and what it means in the discussion. If you're doing a quality improvement or a service review, um, one of the tips is to, uh, you, you would still focus on keeping the, the, the background section short. Um, but one of the things to think about is making sure that your work has a broad appeal. So if you're going for a national conference and you go Lismore Base Hospital, you know, people who live in northern New South Wales, what Lismore Base Hospital is like, but someone from Perth who's reviewing your abstract might not. Whereas saying a 280 bed public hospital on the New South Wales North Coast is a lot more informative. It's also one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine words rather than three. And this is the tension. Um, making it informative versus making it concise. If you are talking about changes that you made for to a service or uh, an improvement activity that you put in place, tell people why. Why did you need to do this? What were you trying to fix and how did you know it was a problem? Um, where possible, try and describe your processes and outcomes. And if you don't have outcomes yet, and this is one of the things that's fairly common in improvement activities. Um, and as a quick example, this is why a lot of local health districts across New South Wales have innovation awards and not evaluation awards, because we're good at starting new things, not so great at measuring what they do. Um, but if you haven't yet measured it, say what you will measure. Uh, we'll know this is a, success, is a success if we see a decrease in representations to the emergency department. So you want to analyse what you've done, not just tell people what you did. So analyse, don't just describe, and again, bring in the so what factor. Now that we know this, what does that mean for us? What can we do with it? Uh, if you were looking at doing some kind of policy analysis abstract, one thing to bear in mind is that each state or territory in New South Wales is set up a little bit differently. Uh, so if you're talking about local health districts and policies of local health districts in New South Wales, for example, that doesn't necessarily track very well in Western Australia where they've got a very centralised system or, uh, or even worse in Victoria where they've got a very decentralised system. So, and so for example, in Victoria, you've got these much smaller areas where basically each hospital does their own thing. So it, it sort of makes you take a step back and just check your assumed knowledge. You know, I know what I'm talking about in my space. How well will that translate into another space? Again, you want to analyze, not just describe. And if you're analyzing a policy, why? Tell people what sparked the need to do this. And again, the so what. Um, now that we understand this, what can we do with it? For arts and creative abstracts, it gets a little tricky because you're not allowed to use pictures in your abstract. And you can't do a video of interpretive dance. Or, or whatever it is, your, your creative thing. Um, so for creative type abstracts, you have to do the best you can. Um, stick with the format that is familiar, use the words, and again, make sure the so what factor is really, really clear. And it's no surprise that for our next little reflection activity is getting you to think about what is it that you want to share that's new and what's the so what factor now that we know this so what what can we do with it okay i'm going to take a pause for a sec thank you francis for oh no zoe has come through with the goods francis got away with it um so yes, uh, what information about ethics approval should we include? Usually not anything in the abstract. 
you would often speak to that in your presentation or on your poster or in your workshop, but you wouldn't necessarily need that kind of information in your abstract. Words are at an absolute premium. And so, um, yes. Um, so words are at a premium. You don't want to have to spend them saying ethics for this president, this project was by the local health district ethics committee approval number, blah, blah, blah. Nah, skip that. Okay, uh, question back from Fiona. What's a lightning presentation? It's a really, really short one, like three minute thesis. You got three minutes to tell people your idea. Um, they can be fun. Um, they make you be really, really, really certain about what you want to say because um, you can't fluff around at all. Uh, OK, next question from Victoria. What are the pros and cons of presenting at different stages of the research project, ED talking about the topic slash literature review compared to presenting after the project completion? Um, good question, Victoria. Sometimes you have to jump on a conference just because it's the right audience, even if you're not finished yet. Um, so you might tell people about your plan for your research, um, which, you know, that's kind of exciting. Um, you might tell people about the background. So as Victoria, as you were saying, the presenting the, the topical literature review. Um, look, there, there's value in all of that. I think one of the things that can be a bit tricky with uh, a literature review is coming out with the so what from that. Uh, if your so what is, and now I know what I need to explore in my research project, that's lovely, but it's perhaps a little less useful for other people. So perhaps spending some time thinking about the, now that we know this, what can other people use this for? Um, but I'm a big believer in there's no wrong time to talk about your ideas. Um, the more you talk about them, the better they get. I've had some projects where I've talked about them in the planning stages, in the middle stages and at the completion stages. And I found different things to talk about every time. So, uh, one of the cons is unless you've got someone else paying for your all of your conference fees, it's going to get pretty exy. So you might have to have a bit more of a practical consideration of if I'm only going to get one shot at presenting this, if I can only afford to go to one conference, what's the one conference I really, really want to go to? And it might be in Broome, even if that's not the best <coughs> fit for your stuff. It was really nice in Broome. I haven't been back since. So, OK, right, as much as I'm going to reminisce, let's keep on moving. OK, one of the things that's really helpful um, for getting your abstract accepted is to have a catchy title. Um, now, one of the traps that a lot of people fall in, they might have a research question and think that that needs to be the title of your abstract. It doesn't. Preferably something short and punchy. Remember how the National Rural Health Conference said 12 words maximum. But one of the tricks that's really helpful for getting your abstract accepted is using words from the conference theme in your title. And what that does is it really says, this is a good fit for your conference. Look, here are all of the words that you used in your conference theme, and they're in my title. That's how good a fit it is. And if anyone's ever been on a conference organising committee, you'll know how many hours people, I was going to say argue, uh, debate the exact wording of a conference theme. They put a lot of work into it. So if you can reflect that back in your work, it is saying to them, this is a good fit. And I've said there, don't be shy. Yes, don't be, be shameless, I think is what I'm really trying to say there. Um, try and avoid jargon and look, bonus points for puns. They really work for some people. Um, yeah, sure, go for it. Make them puntastic. Let's give an example. 
So the 17th National Rural Health Conference, abstract's open at the moment. No, I'm not on the organising committee, committee and I don't get a commission. Um, it's just relevant to us here in rural health. Their theme for this year is rural health, inspire, imagine and innovate. Now, Zoe and I are both authors on another conference abstract that we're uh, myself and one other person are presenting in a week and a half. And this is our title, Bringing Research Learning to the Bush, the RR Clan Education and Training Calendar. If we were going to rebadge, or if we were gonna write that um, abstract title for the National Rural Health Conference, we'd need to look at that theme rural health, inspire, imagine and innovate, and would come up with something like this. RR Clan, an innovative learning approach to inspire rural research. Okay, and if it wasn't obvious enough, we've taken the rural and we've put that in there. We've taken the inspire, we've put that in there. We've taken innovate, we've put that in there. As I said, be shameless. Now, when you first look at it, uh, uh, Clan, an innovative learning approach to inspire rural research, you wouldn't think that's a cynical uh, attempt at wedging in words from the theme. Well, it's not cynical, it's smart. It's, it's using their words to emphasize that alignment. Now, conferences generally don't have one theme. They'll often have sub themes or topic areas. And if, you are, are sitting down to write your abstract. Obviously, you want to align with one of these topic areas. So again, this is from the National Rural Health Conference. And if we were to do a, an abstract on our, our clan, it would come under rural and remote health workforce issues, infrastructure, education, and training. And so we could use words from that topic area or sub theme to link in as well. So we might be able to weave in the word infrastructure or the word workforce or something like that into our title as well. Um, if you were going to do something around chronic illness, then you would go, well, how can I put in innovate, inspire, chronic and disability? How can I work all of those in to try and make, make it clear that my topic is a good fit? Okay, over to you. Can you incorporate words from your conference theme into your title? So if you've got a particular conference in mind, um, have a look on their website, find out what the theme is and see which words you can shamelessly weave in. And can you make it short and punchy? I'll just go back to our one we did here. RR Clan, an innovative learning approach to inspire rural, rural research. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine words down from down from 12. Um, bearing in mind that RR Clan is definitely totally one word for sure. All right, while you're reflecting, I'll just check the chat. We'll keep moving. Um, just to give you an example of how you align your conference theme, your work to conference themes and audiences, I was involved in a, a project some years ago looking at a public private partnership physiotherapy thing, new graduates. Now we presented that several times and the first was at the Rich Forum, the very first one. I don't think it even had a theme. It was the very first one. And we had the title of new graduate physio public private partnership. And what we were trying to do was describe the model. But we also wanted to present at the Rural Health and Research Congress and the theme there was rural health horizon shaping our future and you know a public private partnership new graduate physiotherapy recruitment and education program who benefits Whew. wow uh, that's a bit wordy um, that was describing the outcomes didn't really nail the whole theme thing there uh, but we also presented at a business 
Leadership and Education Symposium, which had New Frontiers planned for the future. And so that aspect that we wanted to look at there was partnering for the future, describing a blah, 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 ed recruitment and education. So you can see we've worked the word future in there. One of the interesting things about that is it, it's not kosher to rerun the same Prezo at multiple different conferences um, because you know, it's just not the done thing. Um, but what you can do is you can focus in on different aspects of the same thing for different audiences. You might also note that we had different um, authors uh, on each of those things because different people contributed to different bits and that's okay too. You don't have to have the same people on the same stuff all the time. If people contribute, then absolutely. Um, they should be recognized as authors, but if they haven't, you don't have to. So just a note on research in progress. Uh, the Rural Health Conference that I keep talking about, you know, we're six months out and that's when they're looking for abstracts. So sometimes, you know, it can be three months, it can be nine months before the conference. Um, so sometimes you're wanting to present something at the conference and it's still going, you haven't got there yet. That's fine to submit abstracts for research in progress. Just say that it's in progress. So you might say this research in progress uses this particular research design. Um, so just name it up, be upfront about it. Um, you might not have results yet, but tell people the kinds of results that you will get. So as I've got there, the results of the study include a thematic analysis, will include a thematic analysis or preliminary analysis has shown blah, 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 and full results will be presented at the conference. So you won't necessarily be able to say these are the results, but you can say these is this is what the results are going to look like and who these results will be interesting to and how they might be used. So findings of this study will be of interest to or results of the study could be used for. So you're not preempting your findings. You're saying this is the kind of results we'll get and this is who it's going to be of interest to. But because you've said it's in progress and you know this is what I will be able to present, then the conference organisers and the scientific committee will know what it is they're saying yes to. OK, so just we've talked a lot about fit. We've talked a lot about structure. We've talked a little bit about emphasis. Now some writing tips. First thing, you want to make sure you've got one clear message. You don't have to put everything in the one abstract. And it might be that you have multiple abstracts. Um, so that previous one that I showed you about the public-private partnership, that was a, a recruitment and education program. We might put in one abstract where we focus on recruitment and another abstract that we focus on education. But like I've emphasized more than once, Give the bulk of the word count to what's new because that's what people come for. Now, it's important to be aware of conventions. Um, if you're doing a biomechanics conference, you probably wouldn't be doing uh, insider reporting. You wouldn't be saying stuff like, we did this and I did that. Um, you know, it might be more traditional in that setting to report from outside, this study has found. Um, so you know, just be aware, one of the ways to find out what those conventions are is to go online and look at previous abstracts from that conference. Now we're getting really into micro stuff, putting nouns and verbs close and early in each sentence. Keep sentences short. Where possible, try and avoid value laden phrases and hyperbole. No. Uh, access to healthcare is a looming crisis in rural health. Um, yeah, that tends to put people off. And attention to detail is important, and you don't have to limit those words from the theme just to the title. Putting it up front is great, 
but weaving them right the way through your abstracts really helpful. So the take home messages, firstly, as I keep saying, conferences have a clear theme. So use the words from a theme in your abstract to make that alignment explicit. People come to conferences to find out what's new and what they can do with it. And so you want to have one straightforward message clearly presented. And if you think back to what we talked about right at the start about what leads to acceptance, it's those three things of the theme, what's novel, and then making sure it's good quality. OK, and there's a, a better picture of Grumpy. I'm going to stop talking and throw back to Zoe just for a sec. Oh, Zoe, dollar in the jar. No, I was going to say, I'm, I'm talking I haven't yet. I haven't yet. <laughs> Thank you so much, David, for a fantastic presentation. And goodness me, there were plenty of gems in there for how to get your next conference abstract not only started, but also accepted. So thank you so much. I learned some things along the way as well, which is great after a seasoned researcher. Just to flag before we come back to any questions, there are a couple in the chat, but we've got a absolutely fantastic presentation coming up next month in uh, April, Knowledge Translation, Applying the Knowledge to Action Framework. Registrations are open and I'll pop that link in the chat very shortly. And one more uh, slide. We really do appreciate everyone attending today. We know everyone's got a busy clinical load or busy workload full stop, and it does take a bit of time to get an hour of your day. So if you don't mind taking a minute to complete our survey, um, apologies that came up really large in the chat box, but you won't miss it. Um, that would be fantastic too. We are always looking for ways to improve the presentations that we're providing and the education that we're delivering. So I'd like to hand it back to you, David, and if there's any questions, uh, please feel free to pop it in the chat or come off mute and ask your question directly to David. Thank you. So, David, it looks like there's um, the, the question again, just around um, what do, what ways do conference abstracts differ from article abstracts? So, yes, just to, to reinforce that conference abstracts are very much uh, you demonstrating to the conference organisers that your work aligns with their intended theme, um, whereas a an article abstract is more of a summary of what's coming next. Um, now, there was a question about uh, what do we keep in mind once we're sitting and submitting an abstract for an e-poster? Um, you're, you're, whether you're doing a um, poster abstract or a presentation abstract, the content and structure is going to be very much the same. Um, the thing about e-posters is that sometimes it's hard to know how uh, much space you've got to work with and how much content you can put on. So uh, your abstract won't be different, but the way you actually design your poster will be. Um, one thing to bear in mind about um, e-posters is it might just pay to find out from the conference organisers how they intend to display the e-posters. Um, I've worked with someone who um, the e-posters were displayed on a an interactive board where people would scroll through, um, but they would always be organised alphabetically from um, author's surname, based on author's surname. So to find, you know, my friend's uh, e-poster, people actually had to scroll through like, you know, 60 different posters. And so basically they, they didn't get a lot of views. So um, that that was the, um, the the issue there. So it, it always just pays to, to ask, how is this gonna actually work? Okay. Any other last questions?
David, mm -hmm. um, can you ask um, the last question, please? And thank you so much for responding to the uh, e-poster question. Sure. Um, so um, sometimes it's really challenging um, uh, when there is a huge team and then somebody needs to be like a corresponding author or the first author on the pu um, publication as well as, as on the, you know, conference. So, yeah. uh, yeah, so what's the best approach um, okay. in deciding who the, the first author is? And congratulations yes. on your PhD. I know the struggle. Um, I completed like a few years back, so I know the huge effort. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, look, the politics around who gets to be first author can get a little bit tricky sometimes. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit old school in that I believe the person who does the most work gets to go first. Um, and if you're the first author, you get to then lead the conversation about who goes second, who goes third, etc. Um, different professions have different rules around that. Um, some people believe it should be, you know, whoever does the most work goes first, whoever does the next most work goes second, and so on and so forth. Um, other professions have a, you know, the, you've got the prestige position is the last author. And so um, the person who did the most work goes first and the one who's really behind it all gets to go last. Look, there's different ways. Uh, for clinician researchers and people like me, as long as I'm on there somewhere, I don't care which bit I get, to be honest. Um, but one of the things when you do have a large team, um, one of the things that can be really, really helpful is um, to have people actually do that four point checklist that Zoe put in the chat from the ICMJE, the International Council of Medical Journal Editors, uh, their checklist to say, yes, I have met the requirements for authorship. And if people can't do that, then you would acknowledge them in the acknowledgement section of your presentation or your, your journal article, but they don't get to be authors if they haven't contributed and if they can't sign off on that. And that's something that you tend to see more and more in journals now is that people actually have to do a declaration stating that they have met the requirements for authorship. Oh yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it, it, it's really simple in when you're working in the LHD, but things do get complicated when it's like a partnership between uni and LHDs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. thank you so much. And look, my, my little get out tip for that is in every research protocol that I do, um, I put, I'm going to be the lead author on this and then people will be listed in author in order of contribution to the written work, which might be different to their contribution to the study. And if you want to play in this study, then that's the rules you're signing up to. So if you don't want to do that, then don't come and play. But it does take a little confidence to be able to do that too. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, David. I might draw this seminar to a close. Again, I, I think everyone's found it extremely valuable. I know I have. And thank you everyone for attending. We look forward to seeing you all in April. Registration link is in the chat and otherwise you'll be hearing from RR Clan very soon. Thank you again, David. A fantastic right, thanks session. Thanks everyone. Bye.